Today at the National Press Club, Chief Executive of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Andrew McKellar. With the government's job summit a fortnight away, Mr McKellar will outline the business community's case for economic reform. Andrew McKellar with today's National Press Club address. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club of Australia and today's Westpac Address. I'm Steve Lewis and I'm a director of the National Press Club. Change your government, change your country. It's an old maxim. I don't think it's ever been truer than the last several months when we've seen a new government, after nine years of Conservative rule, a new Labor government uh, come to office and change the, the tone and the culture of the political narrative. And that's never been more evident, I believe, than the Jobs and Skills Summit, which will be held in Canberra, the National Capital, in just a couple of weeks' time, September 1 and 2. It'll bring together business and unions, traditional foes, together along with parliamentarians, not-for-profits and others, to try and see if we can forge a common direction uh, to so that Australia can emerge from the pandemic stronger and more resilient. One of the participants at that Jobs and Skills Summit uh, is Andrew McKellar, the head of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, one of Australia's leading representative bodies for business and industry. Andrew's been at the helm of Aki for about a year. Uh, he's been in Canberra for many, many years. I first met Andrew when he was working for the then uh, opposition uh, under the tutelage of uh, John Moore, uh, one of uh, the former industry ministers. Andrew's going to talk about what he expects from the Jobs and Skills Summit, some of the challenges that uh, will be discussed, debated, and his hopes that out of it will come a new consensus for a more skilled, more prosperous Australia. Please welcome Andrew McKellar. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve, for that introduction, uh, and indeed, uh, it's wonderful to look around the room, see so many familiar faces, so many friends, uh, so many members of Aki. So I can begin today, firstly, by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. We honour their ongoing connection with the land, environment and the community in this region. I warmly welcome also any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander Australians joining us or watching this broadcast today. <clears throat> Can I also acknowledge, of course, a number of uh, very special guests joining us today, including Xavier Simonet, the CEO uh, of Austrade, and also Mr Tim Yeen, the Associate Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. In addition, there are a number of uh, ambassadors and other senior members of the diplomatic corps uh, in the room with us today. Your Excellencies, a warm welcome to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a competition for our future. Just as the 2.4 million Australian businesses compete every single day, the realignment of the global economy requires that we too must compete. Over the coming decades, there will be significant challenges to simply maintain, let alone improve on, economic growth and the broader wellbeing needed to secure national prosperity and the way of life that we all aspire to. A sustained and comprehensive commitment is required so that the economy has the dynamism to deliver the sustainable economic growth that we need. Only with competition can we lay the foundations for a prosperous Australian future. Competition is what built Australia and what powers it forward. Competition is what enabled businesses to be innovative, agile and resilient through a once in a century pandemic. And competition is what will enable us to overcome the challenges and realise the opportunities to revitalise economic reform now. <clears throat> it's the nature of this competition that makes voices like Aki so important. It's important because many of the big challenges begging meaningful action require state, territory and federal governments to work together. 
through our federation, Aki's federation, of state, territory and local chambers of commerce, we will work with policy makers at every level to ensure that job creators have a seat at the table. It's important because the decisions that will determine our economic future won't just be made in the boardrooms of our biggest employers, they will also be made across the countertops of millions of small businesses and the kitchen tables of hardworking families. Our network of leading industry associations and major companies means we can leverage our economy-wide network for business big and small. And it's because, and it's important because as the pandemic has proven, Australia's economy is undoubtedly a global one. As members of the International Chamber of Commerce, business at the OECD, and the International Organisation of Employers, our global ties make Aki a strong advocate for greater international economic engagement. For Australia to remain internationally competitive, a renewed and ambitious reform agenda is required to support our economic prospects. Yet many have lamented the inability of our political leaders at times to elaborate a convincing narrative for far-reaching economic reform that is required. We go back to the Hawke government, which began with the 1983 Economic Summit. And that sets a high bar for the consensus that the Albanese government possibly hopes to now emulate. <clears throat> Against the backdrop of the Prices and Incomes Accord, that 1983 summit set in motion a comprehensive economic agenda led by then Treasurer Paul Keating that systematically reduced tariffs, floated the dollar, privatised government assets, instituted broad deregulation and reformed competition policy. It was an ambitious agenda. The Howard government continued a program of winding back regulation, boosting competitiveness and reformed our tax system with the introduction of the GST. However, the Howard government's early success in workplace reform was followed by changes under work choices that many would say pushed the boundaries too far and contributed to that government's ultimate defeat and also to a reversal of those particular reforms. The Rudd government began with lofty ambitions, but its attempt to implement reforms such as the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, CPRS, failed, giving rise to the, the decade-long and futile climate wars that hopefully we are only now just emerging from. The far-reaching Henry review of the tax system was doomed as a result of the proposed mining super profits tax, and nothing like it has been attempted since. Yet it's not as if we are incapable of achieving major economic change. History tells us that we can. The realisation of earlier reforms required bold and innovative leadership. And in many cases, it was difficult to build consensus behind these ambitions. Courage was needed to press on with the changes that enhanced our place in the world. As we move towards the Jobs and Skills Summit, the challenges we face are clear. First, supply-side constraints are holding Australia's economy back. These include an historic worker shortage, the most acute supply chain disruptions in half a century, and an unprecedented stimulus overhang, all contributing to a 21-year inflation high and an end to cheap money as the Reserve Bank tightens its belt. Second, a gridlocked industrial relations system, stopping efficiency and forcing down international competitiveness of Australian business. <coughs> Bargaining at the enterprise level is withering on the vine and the so-called modern awards are little more than an echo from the days of centralised wage setting. 
And third, languishing productivity, with growth in the last decade slumping to its lowest level in 60 years. The most recent downgrade in productivity projections is expected to result in a loss in tax revenues of $120 billion over the next decade. These are significant challenges that we face. And faced with such challenges, we must ask ourselves, are we ready to compete? Is there a renewed ambition to make the hard decisions and to convince the community of the benefits? So far, the government's climate change bill and its broader plan to decarbonise the Australian economy is a positive first step. Combined with a comprehensive energy policy, this will help secure the planning, investment and innovation necessary to underpin an efficient, an efficient transition to a net zero future. And as the Productivity Commission has recognised, addressing climate change is an important economic reform. It means harnessing our enormous competitive advantage, supporting job creation, driving down costs and growing businesses. It's an opportunity. But what about the broader challenges to revive stalled productivity and to foster economic growth? How do we stack up against our competitors? Here, meaningful action necessitates that we engage thoughtfully in debates of our economic future and recognise the role that free enterprise must play. Businesses must not and will not stand on the sidelines in these debates. Now, I understand that many will be sceptical about what can be achieved at next month's Jobs and Skills Summit. But I think we need to be optimistic and business must play its part. Indeed, this is the best opportunity we've had to restart, restart substantive economic reform in more than a decade, perhaps even in a generation. With international borders flung open, our competitors are racing to access the, the best talent, the best markets and the best ideas, and Australia is at risk of falling behind. Indeed, Aki's objectives for the Jobs and the Skills Summit reflect this challenge to play catch up. First, we are in a global competition for talent. Now, every week I talk to CEOs and business leaders across multiple industries in each state and from businesses of every size. And they tell me this, Australia's workforce shortage is a crisis. It's causing supply chain bottlenecks and driving up inflation. It is undermining growth of every business. Employers are furiously competing to attract and retain the talent that they need in the tightest domestic and global labour market in decades. And in response, the Chamber has outlined a three-pronged approach to address the dual dilemma of jobs without people and people without jobs. It's a plan that will build our workforce and enable Australia to stay competitive. First, we need bold skills and training reform. Indeed, the best way to increase skilled talent is by training our own. The finalisation of the new national skills agreement by state, territory and federal government is a top priority. This agreement, this new agreement, needs to deliver a real funding increase to our vocational education and training system. It needs to grow the number of funded students. Establishing a new body called Jobs and Skills Australia that the government has committed to do. This will be instrumental in tackling the burgeoning skills deficit and to future-proof us against recurring worker shortages. Past experience tells us that Australia's vocational education and training system works best when it is working in lockstep with the needs of industry. We're working closely with government and the ACTU to ensure that industry 
is represented at all levels of workforce planning and the skills system. The surge in apprenticeship numbers in recent years under the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Program has proved to be outstandingly successful at rebuilding our skills base. Unfortunately, the new apprenticeship incentives that were put in place by the previous government in its budget in May are simply not enough. We cannot afford to see apprenticeship numbers nosedive again. At a minimum, there should be a 30% wage subsidy in the first 12 months of apprenticeships and first six months of one year traineeships. If we can do that, this will help ease some of the financial pressure that businesses face when taking on an apprentice or a trainee. Second, there is still much more work to do to get people off the sidelines of the labour market and back into the game. With unemployment at 3.5%, we must maximise workforce participation and recognise there's never been a better time to get those that face significant barriers back into the workforce. Promisingly, participation levels are at record highs, particularly for women. But the gap is closing too slowly. Investment in childcare will minimise cost and enhance women's ability to come back into the labour force in stronger numbers to participate, as will other options such as more effective in-home support. For people with a disability, we must reintegrate disability employment services back into mainstream employment services. Improve direct support to job seekers and streamline points of contact for employers seeking to find staff must also be implemented. Introducing a training to work program will help disadvantaged job seekers and long-term unemployed to undertake work experience at the same time that they're able to do vocational training and should provide a pathway to permanent employment. And while we're talking about expanding our local workforce, we should not overlook the vast pool of talent that is heading for the exits in droves. It's amazing, but every day, more than 400 baby boomers are retiring from active work. The experience and expertise of older Australians should not be ignored, and changes to aged pension settings to incentivise greater and longer workforce participation must also be on the agenda at the summit. And finally, third, we must reinvigorate our migration program to meet the needs of a 21st century economy. While we must build our own skilled, educated and diverse work workforce, Australia must also remain an attractive destination for the world's best and brightest. We very much welcome the government's recognition of the significant economic value derived from an ambitious and sustainable immigration plan. A great place to start is raising the target for the permanent skilled migration intake up to 200,000 people a year, at least for the next two years, to address the staffing crisis we're seeing across the economy right now. While a recent uh, ramp up in resourcing to unblock visa, the visa processing type pipeline is also welcome, more can be done. Business simply cannot afford backlogs of up to nine months uh, in visa processing when countries like Canada and the UK are racing ahead. This isn't just about adding more staff to process visas, but rather about it removing the overlapping priorities that slow down processing times. Our skilled migration program could once have been described as world leading, but over the, the last few years, we have burdened it with restrictions, red tape and rising costs, removing its ability to respond to genuine skill needs. It's time we got back into the race. If we want to unlock productivity gains and drive genuine economic reform, 
we must participate in the competition for the future of work and return to a simpler and more effective enterprise bargaining system. Only this will reverse the significant de decline in agreement making that we've seen since 2010. Government, employers and unions all agree that, the de that a decline in the number of enterprise agreements has fuelled low wages growth, poor productivity outcomes and rigidity in workplaces. The summit provides an important opportunity for these groups to come together in a collaborative manner to agree some practical solutions. Government must be an active participant in these discussions alongside business and unions. And I've been encouraged by the level of engagement by the government to date, but urge it to lean in further so that it can carry a fully formed tripartite deal through to the parliament. Any deal must also be endorsed by a truly representative cohort of business and union representatives. With its diversity of size and industry, business is represented by more than one voice. And it is medium-sized businesses that have seen the greatest decline in agreement making. And it's through them that the greatest gains can be achieved. And it's for this reason that Aki is working with the BCA and with AI Group, the three peak employer groups, in an effort to put forward a joint proposal ahead of the summit. Aki is approaching this process with three priorities in mind. First, we want to achieve sensible and modest reforms at the summit, achievable reforms. We will be putting forward specific proposals where we believe consensus can be achieved. Not a wish list of every employer demand. If a deal is to be won, other parties should appro approach this process in the same spirit. We remain open to all changes put forward by others in good faith and that will make the system better for all. Secondly, a priority must be fixing the Fair Work Commission's unnecessarily technical and complex agreement making process. Multiple independent reviews have found this to be the primary contributing factor to the decline in bargaining. Thirdly, all aspects of agreement making, including bargaining, the approval process and the application of the better off overall test must be considered. The better off overall test has become a point of contention between business and unions in recent times. This should not be the case. Recent Fair Work Commission decisions have distorted the intended application of the boot as set out in the Fair Work Act, making it too inflexible and turning businesses and unions away from agreement making altogether. There are certainly mutual gains to be had by considering modest changes to how that test is applied that would not leave employees worse off. We do not propose to put forward any changes that would see employees worse off. We must focus on reforms that shift the needle, that make a real difference. And that's why we are a bit puzzled when we see claims that the trade union movement is prioritising things like the abolition of the right for parties to apply to terminate expired agreements. The reality is this can only be done by the Fair Work Commission if it's satisfied that it's in the public interest and if it's taken into account the views and interests of all parties to the agreement in question. It's not a unilateral right. For us, reform has got to be about much more fundamental issues that go to the heart of ensuring that our industrial relations system is responding to the future of work.
Winning the future also means acknowledging that we are in a competition for capital. The federal government must pull all its available fiscal and policy levers to ensure that Australia is a competitive destination for a new wave of business investment. One of the greatest impediments to growing our economy is the shockingly low flows of private capital. Investment brings new innovations, skills development and enhanced efficiencies needed to boost productivity and to grow our economy. Now, total private business investment has been in steady decline over the past decade, falling from around 17% of GDP to just 10% today, a level not seen since the 1991 recession, the recession that famously we had to have. While there are no quick fixes, the ability to immediately write off investment through the temporary full expansion measure is a good start. Extending this program beyond 2023 will be instrumental in encouraging businesses to make ongoing and renewed investments. Large scale investments are also needed to achieve the greatest productivity gain. An investment allowance with a further 20% tax deduction on major investments above half a million dollars in plant, equipment and machinery will further stimulate this outcome. As surging inflation and rising interest rates continue to chip away at economic conditions and drive up costs, business investment risks being further derailed. With the right policy settings, we can turn the tide and enable small and medium enterprises to level up against their international counterparts, inspiring innovation, growing paychecks and creating jobs across the country. Our globalised economy also necessitates a competition for markets. Seaports are critical gateways for goods entering and leaving Australia, yet Australia's rank as some of the least productive ports in the world, snarling supply chains and slugging business, workers and consumers with increased costs. The World Bank recently ranked the top ports around the world and Australia failed to put a single port in the top 250. Meanwhile, the MUA maintains its chokehold on Australia's ports, trashing any measures that would encourage a more flexible and more responsive workforce. Indeed, a report released last year by the ACCC found that rolling industrial action has destabilised the operation of Australian stevedores in our ports for more than a decade. Today, the stakes are especially high. Australian businesses are still grappling with the supply chain challenges associated with the war in Ukraine and the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic. Cutting the performance gap of our ports is critical to address Australia's languishing productivity, and it will provide access to global markets. Because uncompetitive ports mean uncompetitive businesses. Achieving a high level of productivity requires containers to move as quickly as possible through our ports and keep transportation costs at a minimum. Family and friends style clauses such as that agreed between Hutchison Ports and the MUA mean that 70% of new job appointments must be sourced from employees, families and friends or a union list of names. These sorts of clauses must be barred in any future agreements approved under the Fair Work Act. The same goes for clauses that prevent job losses from automation. We are shooting ourselves in the foot if we stifle access to efficient and innovative port operations that our competitors already have in place. 
we must use the bargaining system to provide for workforce upskilling rather than simply delaying the inevitable. Furthermore, complex regulation, overlapping agency administration and undue red tape governing our ports has similarly curbed their pro productivity. With over 30 agencies and 200 legislative mechanisms governing the operation of international trade, it is vital that federal and state governments reform Australia's international trade regime to streamline their operation. In some cases, poorly conducted port privatisations have also produced near monopoly conditions. The freight and logistics systems that move goods to and from the ports are similarly constrained. Governments must encourage new players to increase competition in our ports. If the government is serious about pursuing economic reform and productivity gains, it must address our grossly inefficient stevedoring operations, which will put Australia on a stronger, more competitive path for the years to come. And finally, to succeed at the Jobs and Skills Summit and beyond, we must have a competition for ideas. We want the summit to be a success. Business will come to the table with a clear agenda and realistic proposals that offer a clear pathway forward. Do we want to see reinvigorated growth leading to higher real wages and better living standards for all Australians? Absolutely. The Australian Chamber seeks a positive and constructive relationship with the ACTU and with unions. We want to be partners in a process of national renewal. We do not need to make trade-offs in proposals for reform in enterprise bargaining, stronger investment in skills, or an ambitious skilled migration program. These things are unambiguously in the national interest. Accordingly, there is a responsibility on all stakeholders to be fair. This is not an opportunity to settle old scores or to push an outdated agenda. Now, last week, the ACTU published an issues paper ahead of the summit. The paper presented some increasingly familiar analysis about recent trends in real wages and the so-called wage share of GDP. It contains some valid warnings about the risks of accelerating global inflation and the dangers of excessive reliance on higher interest rates as a blunt instrument to respond to challenges of an economy facing the most severe supply constraints in nearly 50 years. Worryingly, however, many of that paper's policy prescriptions were throwbacks to a forgotten and bygone era. Direct regulation of key prices, rent controls, labour market re-regulation, and excess profit tax on energy companies, and higher taxes on the distribution of dividends. A closer look at what's actually happening shows that profits and productivity are highly variable. It's definitely not a case of one size fits all. We must avoid excessively simplistic analysis. Recent ABS figures show that mining profits are up 25%. We saw the huge result that BHP Billiton declared yesterday. But accommodation and food services are down by almost 50%. Many businesses are facing soaring labour, energy and materials costs and these are squeezing profit margins. And while we are currently experiencing falling real wages, this will be temporary. Indeed, recent evidence from the Productivity Commission shows that real wages have consistently outperformed labour productivity even in the past decade. If we're going to succeed in the global competition for ideas, we will need to pull together and achieve a level of national consensus not attempted in Australia for decades. So ladies and gentlemen, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. The stakes are high. 
the upcoming Jobs and Skills Summit can and must act as impetus for significant action, a chance for, revi for a revitalised economic agenda powered by the potential of free and fair enterprise. But action must start now. Global forces demand that we remain competitive. Complacency cannot define Australia's future. And try as they might, the critics of competition cannot ignore the reality that it is a force for good. That's why Aki will never cease the, the, to fight for business, boosting prosperity, creating jobs and making Australia a better place to live. Because competition for talent fosters opportunity, driving skills investment and ensuring business is armed with the, the workforce they need. Competition for capital drives business to adopt inspiring innovation and create new jobs. Competition for markets pushes us to engage with the world for our own security and for prosperity. Competition for the future of work enhances productivity and grows wages. And competition for ideas encourages robust debates, uncovers common ground and builds constructive solutions to society's biggest problems. We must be ready because a failure to compete will only see us left behind. Thank you very much. Andrew, Andrew McKellar, thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive speech, lots to unpack. Uh, it may be coincidence, but while you were speaking, there was good news for the Australian employment market. Scott Morrison announced he's not resigning. <laughs> let's, let's talk now about the Jobs and Skills Summit. Uh, Jim Chalmers has just put out the, the government's template agenda, if you like, and reading through it and reading through your speech, there are a lot of common interests and elements. But as you noted in your conclusion, when it comes to business and the ACTU, two of the key players at the summit, you are miles apart on some of those key issues. Can you see a way forward towards a consensus or uh, are the divisions just too, too significant to, get, to, uh, to bridge? Mm. Well, look, thank you, Steve. Uh, and and you know, as I've made very clear, you know, we will come to the summit with a very constructive approach. We think it is fundamentally important that the summit is a success, that it does set the stage to really enable um, a renewed spirit of consensus uh, in Australian public policy uh, and, and that we can make progress. So, look, I, I see that there are some gaps there uh, on questions of immigration, uh, on questions of enterprise bargaining uh, between business and between the unions. We have been working, as I said, behind the scenes. I mean, one of the first preconditions is we've got to have a unified and comprehensive position from business. We're working hard to achieve that, and I'm confident that we will do it. So that you mentioned that, uh, that the BCA, the AI group under Ennis Willux, and yourselves, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Aki, are working together. Will you, release, will you release your wish list before the summit? And if you had one, you know, what's the number one priority going to be for business coming out of the summit? Can you, can you uh, tell us that? Look, I think that the top thing I would say is I think we, we've got to address our migration system. We've got to free that up. We've got to make it so that it works responsibly, uh, responsibly uh, to the circumstances. We have to fix enterprise bargaining. I think if we can do those two things, then I think we will um, be able to get in place some very quick measures that will change the country quickly, which will allow business to respond to these absolutely pressing, crushing shortages, skill shortages uh, and, and supply chain disruptions that we're facing at the moment. We need to increase capacity. We need to be able to restore confidence in business investment if we're going to make a change. We can't just go on with an old policy prescription in those areas. Let's go to questions from uh, the working press. Julie Hare. Hello, uh, Mr McCullough, thank you very much for your speech. I'm Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review mm. and I'm on the board of the National Press Club. Um, I'd just like to pick, up you, pick you up on your comments around schools and training. 
You spoke only about vocational education and apprenticeships, and yet the National Skills Commission has estimated that nine out of every 10 new jobs in the next five years will require a university degree. Mm -hmm. So why have you overlooked the importance of higher education or a university education? Um, I'd also like to know, just across VET and higher education, what levels of centralised workforce planning you would like to see, if at all, and how it would work. And thirdly, sorry, Steve, um, I just noticed your call for a 30% wage subsidy mm. for first year apprentices. Um, I wonder whether that would do anything to improve the current 50% dropout rate of apprentices, one in three drop out in their first year, or whether it is just rent seeking from businesses? Well, uh, thank you, Julie, for your um, questions. Your trio so, of questions. Trio <laughs> questions, indeed. So I'll try and take them as best uh, I can uh, recall them. So look, the, the first thing, uh, of course, you are absolutely right on the fact that uh, so many of the skilled uh, people coming into the workforce uh, in the years ahead will come uh, out of that uh, tertiary um, education system. That's undoubtedly the case. Now, we do have some members in that space, and it's essential that, of course, uh, our tertiary education system is responsive. I guess I am uh, I'm a business organisation uh, with members primarily uh, working in that vocational education and training and, and apprenticeship space, not exclusively. Uh, we cover uh, a broad spectrum, but I think here, in terms of those um, policy priorities, those are areas where we see things uh, needing to be fixed, needing to be responsive. That uh, new uh, national agreement on vo vocational education and training, it does need to deliver a real increase in funding. We do need to increase the number of places there. And what we need to ensure is that it's not just all in the public TAFE system. We have to remember that the overwhelming majority, vast majority, of training that's delivered through that system actually comes through private sector training providers as well. So we need to get that balance right. Uh, the, the other point that I will go straight to is the apprenticeship uh, issue. Uh, I mean, apprenticeships, trade apprenticeships and traineeships are a critical pathway into the labour market. And I don't think we should um, look down on that. Um, I think what we should do is say that uh, we need to have strong levels of opportunity for people for whom that's the pathway um, into a job for life. Now, historically, the challenge for apprenticeships uh, has been for an employer to make the business case, particularly in the first year, to take somebody on to take that risk. And what we've seen is that you know, the critical thing is getting people to commence getting them in, getting the employer to be confident to make the decision to make that commitment and getting somebody into, a, into an apprenticeship or traineeship. And the thing about the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements program is it did make that difference. We got to a point where um, employers were much more confident to do that. We saw um, apprenticeships uh, coming through in record numbers. Um, we don't want to see that drop away. We've seen, I know it was expensive. And that's why we've said, well, let's not go, let's not keep going at that more expensive rate. Let's pull it back to something that is more fiscally sustainable. We say 30%. I think on this point, actually, the ACTU are saying more. So, I mean, I think that's an interesting call. But we think it's been effective. We would say getting people into apprenticeships, getting them started, uh, even if they don't complete, that's not the critical factor. They, I mean, it's important. It's important, but it's not the only factor. And we do see many people who are job ready after one or two years and who will be able to go on and get very good, well-paying jobs with those skills. And it's taking that critical first step. Now, we're not, I'm not playing down the importance of completions. I do think it's important, but I think getting people into that system in the first place has been a success and we shouldn't underestimate how important that's been. Okay. The, th the third point was about workforce planning, whether the government should have oversight of workforce planning and how micro it should be. Uh, look, I think we're always cautious about saying how micro it should be, but we do see this new structure of Jobs and Skills Australia as a step in the right direction. Uh, we are working extremely constructively with other stakeholders, uh, with, with other business groups, our group, and with the ACTU. So there's a lot of common ground on this. You know, I don't think we want to take this down to the level where it's micro, micro detail, but you know, I think, um, as I said in my speech, you know, making sure that we have, you know, at, at all the levels, um, 
those arrangements lined up, then I think, uh, you know, and if we're able to do that with uh, Jobs and Skills Australia as a new structure, a new independent body, um, then I think that's a good model. It, it's drawn on the model of Infrastructure Australia, uh, which the Prime Minister knows well, and I think he's called on his experience from that sector uh, to come up with this model. So I think uh, let's give it a go. Uh, the, the interim structure, the interim legislation has been introduced. Uh, we strongly welcome that. And now uh, we're in the discussion about what the future governance of that will look like and, and, the, and the mandate that it will have. Thank you. Our next question, emphasis question, uh, is from Sarah Eisen. Keep it to one. Thank you. Sarah Eisen from The Australian. Uh, there's been a lot uh, in your speech regarding what the government uh, could or should do, subsidies, migration and so on. But what about the role of business and employers? Do they need to be taking on more responsibility uh, in this time for training? For instance, are employers going to lift their training budgets? Or what is the role of business here? We're looking a lot at government, but what is fair enough for the business community to take on, particularly in the lifting of, of training budgets? Is that something we can expect? Well, uh, thank you, Sarah, for your question. Um, look, absolutely. Um, you know, the business does have a responsibility, and it's one of the things that I tried to uh, bring through uh, in my speech. Uh, we, we are working on a plan. You know, we've emphasised uh, the elements of that plan. Uh, and we've said that uh, investment in skills and training is a fundamental part of that. So, of course, you know, business has to look at how it invests, uh, how it values the results of that training. Um, of course, that has to happen. Equally, uh, finding ways to encourage people who are not currently in the workforce to come into the workforce, uh, that, that's something that we need to see as part of the solution. It's much more difficult for business to shift that needle. Uh, but here we are in a labour market where we have a 3.5% unemployment rate, you know, unprecedented in nearly 50 years. So you know, I think bus business is looking for the ways. You know, we're saying we'll go out and we'll sport, sponsor you know, if we can get access to bring in skilled people that we can't get here or we can't train in Australia, then many employers are saying they will sponsor that, they will do it. Okay, but we don't need to tie them in knots. We don't need to hit them with uh, excessive levies and bureaucracy and red tape and slowing that down and taking six to nine months to get you know, a, a critical skilled worker into the country. Let, let's remember the, these sorts of um, things, these sorts of bringing these skills to Australia, it, it's a win-win. You know, it adds to demand, it builds jobs, it adds to growth. Uh, it's, it's not something that's offsetting domestic wages. So those are the sorts of things that I think business is seeking and advocating and calling for. Um, we don't determine the rules in the, in the enterprise uh, system. That's where things are broken. With some simple steps, we can make it work again. And of course, employers have spent decades trying to make that system work. But further to Sarah's question, first second year apprentices get paid <coughs> pitiful wages in Australia. Uh, somebody can enter the most junior ranks of the Commonwealth Public Service and earn double mm. what a first year chippy, sparky would earn. Mm. Why, don't, why don't you, as the leading, uh, one of the leading business bodies in this country, support an increase in wages paid for by employers for, say, first and second year apprentices, rather than relying on governments to have to uh, top up through wage subsidies? Why doesn't business, and at a time when business are making record profits, why doesn't business uh, do more of the heavy lifting when it comes to getting apprentices into the system? Because once they get third, fourth year, they will stay because they know there are good wages to be made, particularly if you're a carpenter like my son. So, so many, uh, so many points there, Steve. But look, I, I mean, I'd, I'd say uh, one essential point. Say, I'd say, say a couple of things, and I think that is uh, many businesses, of course, are making that commitment. You've got to look at what the overall aggregate situation is, and it's only when you can make that business case, that you will get that outcome. Now, that's what the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Program did in a very difficult um, situation. Uh, so, look, I think, you know, um, what we need are policies that work. They need to be cost-effective uh, policies. Yes, business needs to no play. There, business needs to play its part. Uh, but if we, if we don't want to see things like apprenticeships dropping back from the record levels that they've been at, then I think that's, that's the kind of policy arrangement that uh, we, we need to get into. Now, wages, yeah, we, as I said in the speech, you know, 
Do we want to see wages growing as productivity grows? Of course we do. There has to be a fundamental link, and if you look at the data, there has been. You know, um, yes, real wages growth has been slower in recent years than in um, much of the time in the recent past. We will see wages growth going up, and we are seeing, uh, I don't think the wage price index measures that particularly well, but if you look at what's happening out in the marketplace at the moment, there are many employers who are paying significantly higher wages to try and attract uh, the talent and the skills that they need. Yes, you have to start somewhere, and with an apprenticeship, you know, you're starting with a low base of skills. You've got to make that investment. Um, and once you've got some of those skills, then I think you know, many employers, you, 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 you're on your way. You know, you've got the skills to give, keep you in a job for life. Our next question is from Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Hi, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, I want to take you to climate change. And you spoke in your um, speech about uh, climate action is the central pillar of Australia's economy. And so far, the business community appears to have reacted reasonably positively to the Albanese government's plan for climate action. But the balance of power is held by the Greens Party and by pro-climate action uh, independents who are looking for tougher action on climate. In your opinion, in the business community's opinion, how much more tougher action on climate would you want to see? Would you like to see? Would you be willing to see? Uh, would you, how would you can, uh, react to things like tougher restrictions on the opening of coal and gas mines? Well, thank you for your question, Ben. Um, look, I, I think there's been a um, significant change in the position of business on this issue over a period of several years. You know, if you go back uh, to the time when uh, the um, CPRS was being proposed. You know, there were active business voices, including Aki itself, that were expressing significant reservations about the impact of that arrangement uh, and in opposition to it. We've rolled forward a number of years now. Uh, I think business sees the urgency and the imperative of doing something meaningful, much more meaningful on climate change and business is on board. So, I mean, I think the government, you know, is to be commended for the fact that they have been very positive. Um, Chris Bowen and his colleagues, they've brought a policy which has been successful in building that consensus and agreement across a broad group of stakeholders, all of the leading business associations and many other stakeholders uh, in civil society supporting that plan. And I think, you know, we're very grateful for that. We've signed on to it. It's not without its risks. It's not without its adjustment costs. Uh, we've got to go along with that because we recognise that the costs of not acting are much higher than the costs of taking action. Now, for business, one of the top priorities is having access to uh, affordable, secure, sustainable energy. That's a critical part of the equation. Um, and you know, we've seen in recent times how um, the energy system, electricity system, gas supply is struggling at the moment. So getting that essential investment into areas like new renewable energy capacity, upgrading the network to take that energy, uh, that's fundamentally important. Business is on board with that. Um, I think if there was a suggestion that the government, and they haven't done this at all, was going to depart from its plan, then obviously that would present an issue. And I think that would run the risk of fracturing the consensus. And I think the government is to be commended for sticking to its guns. It took a proposal to the election. It's sticking with that proposal. Proposal. It's brought in the first part of that. Um, there's a lot more detail to come, and that's what we've got to start working through. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Paul Carr. Thanks very much. Um, you said that you don't want a six to nine month delay before businesses are able to bring in a, a worker to fill a skills shortage, but the, the primary condition or demand that unions have is that they want to see employers lift wages before they try and import labour. Is, is that fair enough, that, that an employer should try a pay rise before um, bringing in a worker on a visa? Well, I think you know, this, this is a question for the marketplace, and in many businesses, of course, they are doing that. You know, in many industries, we're seeing actually quite significant measures now to attract people uh, into jobs. Uh, I think when you look at things like a wage price index, which is not measuring changes between jobs uh, or anything other than more or less the, the standard uh, you know, uh, remuneration that employees are getting, then in fact, there's a lot more that's happening out there 
uh, in the marketplace in terms of um, wage outcomes. And you know, at some point, we will see that coming through in the data. That's, that's the reality. But the idea here that um, we've got to have some sort of artificial mechanism or checkpoint um, uh, before we try before we start responding to the crisis that we have, I think is, a, is not the right notion. I mean, today I'm seeing reports that the um, ACTU has brought out another uh, paper. I haven't had a chance to go through all of it, but I've seen part of the discussion in, there, in that is that uh, you know, the, the threshold, the income threshold before a business can uh, access um, the immigration stream, temporary immigration stream, uh, they want to increase that from the current level of $53,000 a year up to $90,000 a year. Uh, this would kill many areas of the immigration program overnight. It, it's not a positive move. I mean, we've said that some increase in that threshold could be contemplated. But the reality is we need to recognise that there are very different circumstances across different industries and different businesses and something that might apply in one sector where there's skill shortages uh, is not the same as what it's going well, to be in another. What does some increase mean? Would you be happy with, say, 70,000 as a compromise between business and unions, as a show of good faith ahead of the jobs summit? Well, we, we've put on the table, we've, we've said, what we think a, a threshold, a new threshold of 59, 60,000, something of this order of magnitude would be realistic. I think we would prefer to see a more flexible approach that can be reviewed sector by sector uh, and skill level by skill level. Our next question from Nick Stewart. Two brilliant ideas that you began with for change. The third is going back to this issue, immigration. Uh, it almost sounds as if you want to push immigration back up, uh, push unemployment back up beyond 4% because that's why, that way it's easier to find workers. Uh, is that true? Uh, shouldn't there be a, a more emphasis on actually training, as you began, that VET training for our workers to actually uh, get that rather than employing a, a, a temporary um, solution that will end up with a longer term problem requiring more immigration down the track? Well, no, we're, we're certainly not suggesting uh, that at all. I mean, the reality is that uh, the challenge, as I said in my, my speech at the moment, is jobs without people and people without jobs. You know, what, what we want to see is an outcome. I mean, we want to maintain Australia at full employment. At the moment, we are at or beyond full employment. It is actually physically impossible to match the vacancies that we have, which are at record levels, uh, with the people who are saying that they are you know, not in a position. I mean, one number is almost equal to the other number. But we are never going to get into a situation where you can place every single person down to the last one into a job. We're basically at a level where we are beyond full employment at the moment. And the consequence of that is that we are so seeing that adding to inflationary pressures in, uh, in the economy. We have to address that. Now, if we can come to a solution that gives us a sustainable migration program, if the Australian economy can be kept at or near full employment, we take the inflationary heat out of the economy, uh, we, we're growing productivity, uh, then we're able to boost real wages, boost living standards and keep employment high. I mean, that's the ideal. Now, we've seen you know, that sort of mix at various times in the past few decades, but we're now getting off track. And the red lights are flashing. You know, the danger signs are there. You know, if you go back, I mean, we look at charts all the time. If you go back and we have one of the longest running business surveys in Australia. If you look at our survey, sponsored by Westpac, actually, uh, if you look at our survey of... Uh, in, in, in industrial trends, it goes back to the 1960s. You can see a spike that happened in terms of labour shortages in 1974 and materials shortages in 1974. We're not quite at those levels, but we're the only time since then that we've been at those comparable levels. We know what happened in that period. You know, Now, bell-bottom jeans might have been making a comeback in some places, but we don't want to go back to the mid-1970s in terms of economic policy, that's for sure. Yearning for the good old days. And our final question today from Ella Hodgman. Um, Ella Hodgman on behalf of Tim Shaw. Thank you for your address today, Andrew. Can you please provide some practical examples of where your members will employ older Australians and pensioners two to three days a week? 
assuming the federal government raised the pensioner income threshold as an outcome of the forthcoming job summit? Look, I think there are many, many different opportunities and here, uh, I, mean, I can't prescribe, you know, what are the particular areas. I've seen many examples uh, of uh, situations where older Australians are saying, you know, I have skills, you know, I have a professional uh, background or I have uh, some trade skills uh, that I want to continue to use. Are they in a position to make that choice uh, or do they face a penalty if they're on the age pension? That if they, if they choose to do that, if they want to work more than one day a week, then they're going to see some of that pension stripped away at a pretty uh, aggressive rate. Um, and that's, that's the feedback that we're getting. Um, I think there are many businesses out there that see uh, great opportunities um, for older Australians, Australians perhaps over the age of 65, who have that great set of skills and experience. They don't necessarily want to work five days a week, but they should have the opportunity, if they choose so, to work two or three days a week. Now, the good thing on this is, you know, we are having a good discussion with the government on this. Uh, only yesterday I had a meeting of my members um, with the Treasurer. We talked about some of these issues. We know that they are looking at this very carefully. We'll see what comes out of that analysis, but I think it's a potential opportunity and we've got to find some way. We know that in Australia, if you compare our labour force with that of, say, New Zealand, in New Zealand there's a much higher proportion of um, people over the age of 65 who are still in the workforce. You know, if we had the same level, there'd be another four or 500,000 people we could bring into the labour force. So that's an opportunity we're missing out on at the moment. It's a choice that people want to make. We should give them that choice. Ladies and gentlemen, let's conclude on that note. Um, Andrew McKellar, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, that was your debut performance, very strong. We look forward to having you back here. Good luck in the lead up to the Jobs Summit. Uh, lots to be discussed and debated. We hope that you can find common ground with business groups, with the unions and others. Uh, please accept on behalf of the National Press Club membership. Gets you access to the car park. It's very valuable. Uh, hold on to it. Please thank Andrew McKellar. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Thanks for the tough questions. Very good.